This story is quite controversial. This is the case of Katrina Effort. This case might be quite divisive. She was accused as the killer for strangling to death her newborn son, Rodney. She, in the summer of 2004, 19 years old, first told friends she was pregnant. That summer had been endless parade of wakeboarding, beer drinking, karaoke, cars and parties for Katrina. Everyone in Katrina's gang was just out of high school, working low-wage jobs, charging into the world of adult pleasures and cares. One day, late in the summer, Katrina sought out her friend Vanessa at a house party. Katrina asked Vanessa if she wanted to go outside for a smoke. The two sat down on the curb. Katrina said, I have to talk to you. I found out I'm pregnant. Katrina told a few others of her predicament, including her friend's boyfriend. She mentioned to him that a guy named Dan from Red Deer was the father. The two had sex once, but he used the condom, and that was the last he saw of Katrina. Nine months later, in April 2005, the police knocked on his apartment to tell him Katrina was linking him to the murder of a newborn. You see, Katrina had dreamed of having a house, a husband, and a baby, but her pregnancy didn't fit into the picture. Still, she would not have an abortion. She felt that would be wrong and was scared of getting one. She decided she would keep the baby but tell no one about it. When she felt the baby was about to be born, she would go to the hospital, give birth, and then give up the baby. No one would have to find out. She wouldn't have to tell her parents. So she began to wear loose and baggy clothes. She successfully hid her pregnancy from almost everyone, but not from her mother, Marlene. At the time, Katrina still lived at home with her parents in a bungalow behind a commercial street. Marlene ran a hair salon, while Katrina's father, his name was Kim, worked as a laborer at a home hardware distribution center. Now in December 2004, three months after Katrina had told a few friends of her pregnancy, Marlene heard a rumor that her daughter was pregnant. Marlene thought it was a case of mistaken identity because her son's fiance was pregnant. Still, Marcin decided to confront her daughter. She had been pestering her for a year to go on birth control, but Katrina denied she was having sex. Cheeky minx. However, Katrina looked to Marlene as if she had put on a few pounds. Maybe she was putting on weight because she wasn't exercising, Marlene thought. Katrina denied to her mother that she was pregnant. Katrina feared her mother would push her to get an abortion. At times, she overheard her parents arguing about the issue with Marlene, telling her husband she thought Katrina was pregnant. Her father didn't believe it. Katrina had her father had always been close and would confide in each other. He taught her to drive, and they often worked together fixing cars, including Katrina's minivan. Marlene, however, did not let go of the issue. In February 2005, six months into Katrina's pregnancy, she again confronted her daughter to no avail. That winter, Katrina continued to smoke and kept going out to bars. She would usually have a few drinks at local bars. So, on Thursday, April the 14th, 2005, Katrina gave birth to the child in her basement. A few hours later, she killed the child. Katrina called in sick to Boston Pizza, saying she had the flu. She dumped the baby over her fence into a sheltered spot behind a shed in her neighbor's yard. Her thong underwear was wrapped five times in a tight ligature around the baby's neck. There was no knot. She carried on with her life seemingly as usual. On Saturday, April 16th, she and her father spent the day working on a Toyota in the backyard. She went to her brother's house that night and played cards until 4am. The next day, she went shopping with her mum at Canadian Tire. Later, she visited her sister-in-law and her aunt, then spent the evening watching a movie with her mum. Now, the baby was discovered on April the 18th at 8am by the neighbour. His thoughts went to the girls next door. Katrina and her sister-in-law. He thought they both looked pregnant. What is going on? So a team of 17 officers started working on the case. One that would see them interview 
200 women as the baby's possible mother. Just after noon, on April 18, four days after the homicide, Officer Beth Phillip knocked on Katrina's door, pulled out a tape recorder and interviewed Katrina. Katrina said she didn't see anything or heard anything suspicious. The question may seem a little personal, the officer said, but were you at any time prior to today pregnant? Katrina said, no, I haven't had sex. You lying rat. The officer asked Katrina if anyone around had been pregnant. Katrina mentioned she had suspicions about a young neighborhood girl. This was the first time but not the last time she would cast suspicion on others. After police left, Marlene confronted her daughter and asked if the baby was her child. Katrina denied it, but was upset by her mother's doubts. As her sister-in-law would later testify, she was really mad that her mom would ask her. On April the 25th, 11 days after the homicide, Katrina was asked to come into the police office. She met with Judy McDonald, who was a veteran officer. During their lengthy talk, Katrina came across as chatty and cooperative with nothing to hide. Katrina told McDonald about past boyfriends, how she had two high school boyfriends who cheated on her. She had also dated a guy named Dan from Red Deer. She couldn't remember his last name. She told McDonald that it had some kind of crazy spelling like ASGQ or something. She said they had met in June 2004 and the last hung out at her family reunion in August 2004. Though she had had boyfriends, she was still a virgin. Well, that's what she told the officer anyway. She planned to have sex maybe once she was engaged and wanted kids. She said she wanted it to be one person and one person only. If she had a child, she said she would name him Rodney. The officer asked her, are you ready to become a mother? And she replied, oh God, no. That's why I haven't had sex yet. That's why I don't want a boyfriend. The lies are just a ravel and ravel, eh? McDonald asked Katrina if she had put on any weight. She said she gained five pounds during Christmas, but took off the weight by playing sports. She had played rugby on a women's team recently. Knowing the baby had been found choked to death with thong underwear, McDonald asked Katrina about her underwear. She wore only black or white plain underwear. She said never anything like a thong. She said, what do I need them to be fancy for? I don't have sex. Katrina said she had been hearing lots of rumors about the homicide, such as the baby coming from a young girl or someone on crack cocaine. She had seen a strange vehicle in her neighborhood and two people, a man and a woman, out walking. McDonald asked Katrina what kind of person would murder a baby. She said someone that needs help, someone with problems, either a drug problem or alcohol problem or family problems or relationship problems. I don't know. Katrina allowed police to search her underwear drawer. She also gave them a DNA sample. However, before she was giving this, she actually started to confess. You see, on the morning of April 27th, 13 days after the killing, she approached her father, Kim. He was watching TV. She said, the baby, the baby might be mine. At once, he called the police. When two officers arrived, they found Katrina and her dad crying hysterically in the kitchen. When police interviewed her, Katrina now had a new story. She said she had dated a man named Dan who got her pregnant. When she went into labor, she called Dan. He drove to meet her and she gave birth in Dan's car in the parking lot. She told the police Dan dropped her off at home and promised to take the baby to the hospital. And once she told this story, the police arrested her. After she was checked by a doctor, the police officer McDonald again interviewed her and she gave more details, claiming that later in the morning, several hours after she had given birth and left the baby with Dan, he called her to say he had dropped the child at the hospital. Can you believe that? She has random sex with a guy called Dan. She gets pregnant. She has the baby. She murders the baby. All of a sudden, Dan's got people knocking on his door. Hey, did you kill this baby? All while she's telling the police, well, Dan took the baby. I don't know what he did. What the hell? After the baby's body was found, however, both Dan and his friends called to threaten her if she ratted to the police. This is what Katrina claimed. He told her to get rid of it, allegedly. He just told me that he didn't take the baby to the hospital. Katrina claimed she had no doubts that Dan was the father. She had told him about her pregnancy over the phone in October, saying she planned to give up the baby for adoption. Now, the police officer pushed Katrina on the issue of underwear that night, reminding the girl her DNA would be on her clothing, such as her thong and underwear. She said 
DNA doesn't lie. Is there any reason that we'll find your DNA on these items? Katrina said, well, they shouldn't be. Katrina could provide no motive to the police for Dan killing the child. McDonald told her that the police weren't buying her story, that it made more sense that something happened to the baby when it was with her, and that she herself had put the baby over the fence. No, I didn't put it there, Katrina insisted. I didn't even know until Monday about it. At that point, Katrina was shown a picture of the thong underwear and told that it caused the death. The interview left Katrina with a new fear that the police might find her DNA on her thong underwear. She was thinking, how do I explain this? So the following morning, on April the 28th, she was ready with another version of events. She told McDonald that she gave birth at home. She said, I was scared and I didn't want my parents to know because my mom wanted to get an abortion when she found out I was pregnant. At first, the baby was fine. I held him and I was cuddling. She cut the umbilical cord with scissors. She was going to go upstairs and tell her mum, but held the baby too tight and he stopped breathing. She got scared and she dropped the baby and she was too scared to go to the hospital. Then made it look like she murdered him. What? She was too afraid to tell her mother or she was on the way to tell her mother. She accidentally squeezed and dropped the baby and then she wanted it to look like murder. Her lies or her version of events are just, well, they're comical really. She then claimed that after she dropped the baby and made it look like she murdered him, she was going to go to the hospital but couldn't gather herself. So she put him in her neighbor's yard until she could figure out what to do. McDonald asked if Katrina did anything to the baby before she took him outside. She said, I put my underwear around his neck because she wanted it to look like a murder because she felt like she had murdered him. Adding that the baby wasn't breathing when she put the thong around the neck. McDonald asked, what was going through your mind? To which Katrina said, that I took my baby's life, that I could give him a chance to live because I should have went to the hospital that night. McDonald then asked her, okay, who's the father? To which Katrina said, I don't know. More questions from McDonald revealed that Katrina had narrowed it down to one of four guys. Katrina knew the last name of only one of them. She didn't know Dan's last name. McDonald congratulated Katrina for at last telling the truth but there was still a problem with Katrina's story. The fact that the thong had been wrapped so tightly around the child's neck. A short time later, police interviewed her once more. This time, the police brought in a homicide specialist, Dan McCullum of Calgary Major Crimes. McCullum was more confrontational. He said, there is no doubt in my mind that you are responsible for killing the baby. And you know, and I know how that baby's life was gone. McCullum said he was concerned about one thing, that she never expressed remorse. He asked her, are you sorry for what happened? To which Katrina said, more than anything. McCullum then asked Katrina why she had never talked to someone about being pregnant. She said she was scared. And he asked her, what are you afraid of? And she said, disappointing my family and not being ready to be a mum and my baby not finding a decent home for it to be in. McCollum told Katrina he actually spoke to Dan and then chastised Katrina saying he had gone to arrest the young man. He said, you sent us on a little bit of a goose chase based on what you told us. He could have been arrested and charged for murder. He told Katrina that he believed the crime wasn't planned, that it was done in the spur of the moment, that she panicked because her parents might find out that she took her baby's life. She said, I was sorry and then I tossed him over and I looked at him through the fence for about 20 minutes. And then I went into the house, I was feeling really bad. And I was feeling like I did something that I know I did was wrong and I wanted to take it back. So in May 2005, Katrina was sent to Alberta Hospital for a psychiatric examination. She was put under the care of psychiatrist Dr. Vijay Singh and a team of nurses, social workers and psychologists. In his talks with Katrina, she painted a bleak picture of her relations with her unnamed boyfriend. When a home pregnancy test was positive, she said she spoke to her boyfriend but painted him as a jerk. He was the one who pressured me into having sex with him. He was the one who abused me. I feel quite hurt and betrayed. He always told me he loved me. And when it came to the homicide, Katrina told another tale. This time, that she placed a towel over the baby's mouth to stop him from crying, then fell asleep. She woke up in the morning and he was dead. In this report on Katrina, Dr. Singh concluded she was not suffering from any mental disorders. He wrote she had been in effective denial about her pregnancy, meaning she knew she was pregnant but had none of the accompanying emotional and behavioral changes of pregnancy. Dr. Singh found that Katrina had many of the traits of the typical 
infanticidal mother. She was immature, emotionally isolated from the father, the baby's father, unlikely to be able to support her baby financially, carried the baby in secret, and received no prenatal care and gave birth alone. When Katrina gave birth, Dr. Singh concluded she took the baby's life because of disturbed mind. Katrina was released from Alberta Hospital and went home to work and await her trial dates. In the spring of 2006, her defense lawyer hired a psychologist, Dr. Mark Nesca, to determine Katrina's state of mind. In his report, Nesca wrote, Her experience of childbirth included intense fear and pain. She felt helpless, experienced the process of giving birth as dreamlike, and is unable to recall portions of the birthing process. Subsequent to the birth of her baby, Katrina felt dazed and oddly detached from her environment. It was in this state, suffering from acute stress disorder, a major mental breakdown, that she had taken the child's life. But in the end, Dr. Nesca and Dr. Singh did not agree on Katrina's precise mental state, but did agree that she was disturbed when she took Rodney's life. If their testimony was accepted by the jury, Katrina would avoid a murder or manslaughter conviction, but would be convicted of the lesser charge of infanticide. In both trials, the Crown prosecutors hammered away at Dr. Singh's and Dr. Nesca's similar points, namely that both relied on Katrina's version of events to base their decisions. So if she was lying to them, their decisions were worthless. The prosecutors also drew attention to the issue of Nesca and Singh's disagreeing about Katrina's precise state of mind. Either way, in 2009, Katrina was found guilty of second degree murder and sentenced to life with no parole for 10 years. She then appealed this verdict. During her appeal of her first conviction, the prosecutor suggested that it was Katrina's web of lies and her attempts to manipulate others that led to her arrest and conviction. Her lies to her family, her lies to her friends, her lies to investigators, and even her lies to experts assessing her mental state because the fundamental flaw with the offence of infanticide led to her eventual downfall. But her appeals were successful and she was handed down a three-year suspended sentence. People paintball the Katrina's house and their vehicle had been egged at traffic lights. Marlene had to twice call the police to the beauty salon to get rid of angry people. But another of Katrina's old acquaintances felt the court decision was right. They said they think she got the right sentence. The baby's alleged father, Dan, was least forgiving. In an interview, he said he was disgusted by Katrina's accusations of abuse against him. He said it's not true, there's no proof of anything. Dan doesn't believe the child was his, but thinks Katrina should pay for murder. He said, I think she should go to jail forever. The kid did not have a chance. I agree with him. How dare you give birth, put a thong around his neck, right? Strangle him to death, yeah? And then chuck him away like he's a piece of meat. Three year suspended sentence? Nah, I'm not having it. Comment, tell me what you think.